If you ever say that to yourself, if you ever think you're not good enough, I would suggest to you that it's maybe a human factor issue. Like maybe what has been told that you're supposed to do is not realistic in the setting that you're supposed to do it, and that you need to think through your practice and engineer it differently. Um, so for me, you know, I used to find bagging very frustrating. I rarely bag anybody anymore. I put O's up the nose until I hear jet speed coming off the wall. Which, by the way, is about 70 plus liters in the United States coming out of the wall. A standard 5, you know, 50 cent nasal cannula. But I water skin off the manual, sit on my, that's my first response to hypoxia. I was working in Colorado recently and I had a kid come in with a pulse ox of 60%. You know, it's bad when your respiratory rate exceeds your pulse oximetry rate. This kid's respiratory rate was 80, his pulse ox was 60. And what was amazing was three liters of oxygen, now this is at 9,000 feet, but three liters of oxygen, the kid's pulse ox went to 95. And then he sat there with a binky, just fine, with a binky, meaning his mouth was obstructed. But my first response to hypoxia is always those up the nose. Anyway, um, I want to share with you. So, you know, my kids were little, and lately, my kids being big, we've had some interesting experiences. I threw my kids out of perfectly good airplanes going skydiving with them. Um, we told their mom after the jump, not beforehand. Um, I went to this place in uh, Zion called the Narrows, and my kids turned around to me and said, Dad, this is amazing. Um, and it is. Uh, you should go there before our current president sells the frickin' National Park. <laughs> By the way, growing up in New York in the 60s and 70s, we knew he was an idiot. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I couldn't go there. Um, Alright, so, uh, kids are technically harder, emotionally more stressful. The good news is that the difficult airway is actually less than 10, is 10 times less than in adults. I mentioned to you, Think about your practice. Think about what you've been taught. What you have been sort of silent, you know, assuming as you have trained is that if you try harder, you'll do better. Not if you're doing it wrong. When you don't, when people say, oh, it's tough your way, I couldn't see anything. What I hear is, you overran the other lives. And the way that happens is very easy. You're gripped, you over -gripped the laryngoscope. So much so, and you go in, just, you know what people are telling you to do? Rush. Come on, hurry up, hurry up, don't do, you know, both sides are dropping. All of this makes you over grip the scope, you go past every structure. And then the key thing to understand is that when you are self of everything, there is no amount of trying harder that's going to fix it. I was recently given a talk about this in Mayo Clinic. One of the residents who just finished a 10 year stint in the Navy tells me, he was flying Harrier jump jets, and the carrier commander would listen on the radio to the pilots as they asked for permission to land. And they would look at the way the pilot was flying their aircraft. And because of all the feedback, they know exactly how they're flying it, and you know, they're obviously communicating with these guys. But if the pilot was gripped, they called it squeezing the black out of the stick. But if the pilot was gripped, you would be put into a holding pattern because 5,000 people were on the carrier and if the pilot crashes the plane, that could be life and death for the entire carrier. So basically, if you're too gripped, you can't land. But the key to doing well with the scope is how you pick it up with two fingers. And we're going to talk more about that. Um, you've heard the airway in children is higher, the larynx is higher. I've always heard that, but I never understood it's by design. You know, this whole idea I was telling you about there are many mysteries in life. I do believe there are. But I don't think the airway is one of them. So I'll show you in a moment why the larynx is higher than children. Um, we talk about using stimulated little kids. It has to do with epiglottoscopy and epiglottis control. Um, with kids, they have classically the omega epiglottis. They can to control. So a straight blade gives you better directability to lift the epiglottis. But one of the techniques we can do, it's not illegal, is what I call Mac as a miller. You use a Mac as a miller and you lift the epiglottis. So I'm going to show you that technique. But, you know, I tend to use straight blades to little kids, except when you have a lot of vomit. When you have a lot of vomit and a lot of blood, you know, a four-year-old in K-12 
carried by mom, hit by car at high speed, crossing the street, kid goes flying, kid comes in coding, and it's blood filled air away. It's very hard to control the tongue and use suction well with a straight blade. So there are some advantages to curved blades, but we'll talk about both. Um, you know, kids, the reason why they're so cute is those big eyes, those short thyroidal spaces. Um, and that small displacement space, when you take a straight blade, you're talking about a small volume device. It's easier to sneak around the tongue with less displacement because your volume of your blade is smaller with a straight blade. That's the reason why we talk about using straight blades. But there's been a number of recent studies that say you can use Max, you know, Mac ones in these little kids too. So don't be fearful of picking up a curved blade in little children. Certainly, I would favor a curved blade in high volume, fluid, Pete's aspiration, foreign body with the gills. I go curved blade. You'll have a much better uh, control of the tongue to operate inside the mouth. Uh, you know, we use cuffs down to the very little, and that's a big deal. You know, that last case, for instance. If you don't have a cuff tube in this kid with a big belly, with a small area of FRC, then you can't deliver peep because you're off slightly on your tube size. So, you, you know, there are a couple of things. You want to do well in the airway, you should have a peep valve on every BBM in your ER. Every BBM in your ER should have a peep valve. If it doesn't, you can't deliver peep. That's a problem. You're set up for failure. You know, uh, but you should also have cuff tracheal tubes down to the littlest sizes. Because there are kids who are going to be a half millimeter off, and uh, then suddenly you go near a leak. You can't ventilate the kid. Um, all right, so um, here's the secret to the Pete's airway. Uh, this is not my image, but hang on. Oh. Okay, so this is the breast uh, in the, I lost my particular, oh there it is, in the mouth. So the reason why the peds airway is higher, the reason why the larynx is higher, the reason why the smaller the kid, the lighter your grip, is because the soft palate and epiglottis have to touch. They have to touch for a very specific purpose, which is to hold fluid in the mouth. So if you watch kids breastfeed, what they do is they suction the milk. So they, you know, and then you see them, they flare their nostrils as they breathe, and then they swallow. But they can basically hold fluid anterior in the mouth, breathe through their nose, and then swallow through their esophagus. So it's kind of like a three-part process there. But the first part hinges on the soft palate and the epiglottis opposing one another so you can hold fluid there. That's the reason why, in the littlest ones, you know, it's a half inch or three quarters of an inch that the uvula and the epiglottis touch on insertion. Um, but the other interesting thing about this is it reiterates what I've been saying, that the nose is the primary route of oxygenation. You survive the first year of life intermittently, completely oral airway obstructed. And that's okay. And in fact, all of you are sitting here looking at me going, and your mouths are closed. Uh, we are breathing through our nose. Now, you can no longer swallow fluid and breathe at the same time as an adult. Then, you know, you cough out the fluid through your nose and you choke and you swell. Um, the other thing to think about from the Pete's airway perspective is in adults, we have about six, five or six tracheal rings above the sternal notch. In little kids, when you watch a flaccid little kid, you can see this snake of an airway coming down. Like you see a huge chunk of their trachea. So they have much more tracheal ring exposure. In fact, they got about 10 or 12 rings, the little ones. So trachs are a lot easier technically if you lift them in front of the trachea when you cut it because it's so small and so compressible that you can easily cut the back wall. So when we do cranks, you can cut onto the thyroid without using a hook. When you do a trach, you have to lift the trachea and cut while lifting so you don't cut the back wall. And the other thing is, the trach is small. So, I mean, that's what makes it technically challenging, but it is not hard to find the peach trachea. In Baltimore, every month we go around the room, and for 20 years I've heard of airway stories, and I've heard of dozens of dead kids with foreign body. Repetitive laryngoscopy, surgical airways done after kids code. And 
I heard of one case where they saved a kid's life in advance. What happened was EMS astutely realized that this kid had a possible foreign body. The ER doc and the trauma surgeon had a conversation up front. The plan was one dose of ketamine, look from above, then we're traking him. And that's exactly what they did. And on arrival, uh, they traked the kid. And he had a thumbtack. And it was oriented in a way that the tracheal tube would not go down. And it was basically a clue to his airway entirely. But anyway, it's just an interesting thing to mention on the trach side. The kids are actually easier. I know of one of my residents who finished residency and like first month out, traked a kid. And it was uh, an incredible city. Um, all right, so let's talk about positioning. Um, I stole every sheet and pillowcase to ramp this person up to your external notch. My daughter was two at the time, I mentioned to you. She's not anymore. Here is the oxyplug. And in little kids, your external notch can be aligned without any elevation. In the infants, when you lay that kid flat, their head's going to be tilted down like this and you need something under the shoulders. But I think this ear external notch line uh, is a beautiful thing. Um, it is now standard in bariatric surgery worldwide. Uh, I wrote a paper with some folks out of Stanford. They got endorsed by the Society of Bariatric Surgery. The ramped position for airway management with ear external notch is now a worldwide standard. But I think that it is an important thing in the children to think about. Pete's airways, omega epiglottis, edema has more consequence. If I'm thinking, if there's a kid in respiratory distress and their sets are not great and there's increased work of breathing and it may be some reactive component, the first thing that I tell my nurse before we have IV access, because IV access in these kids can be very difficult, is squirt 0.6 per kg of dex into the kid. Now you can be a purist and say, well, for croup I use this dose, for asthma I use that dose. Basically, 0.6 per milligrams per kilogram, up to 10. I get dex into kids early, um, and then I go right to duo nibs. And I'm amazed how many kids turn around with a duo nib. They sound just terrible, you know. So I put on my nasal oxygen. I run a duo nib through air, and I give 0.6 per kg of dex orally. And then I kind of see how they're doing when we're getting the chest X-ray, working on the uh, IV access, etc. Um, the epiglottis is higher, so we're seeing it here. Here's an epiglottis that you can see coming up. And uh, yeah, so the epiglottis is higher. There are kids with challenging airways. Thankfully, they're few and far between. Um, you know, I am a fan of direct laryngoscopy. I'm a fan of video laryngoscopy when the curved blade has the same shape as a Macintosh. But when would I think about using a hyperangulated curved blade, meaning Glidescope original blade or the Dorges C blade or the C Mac hyperangulated Peds blade, I would think about using hyperangulated blades in cases who have uh, kids with limited mouth opening, um, with limited neck mobility, in some of these situations. Now, ideally, we don't have to do these. Pierre Robert is awful. You have this just no space at all. You know, what's fascinating about these kids is if you blow those up the nose and pull on their mandible, uh, you're going to fix their oxygenation. But getting a tube around the curve of these kids with very small mouths uh, can be really challenging. And once you stabilize them, you know, a lot of these kids electively in the OR are intubated in the scope. Not so much um, downs, but certainly treat your followers up here or um, This kid who one of my colleagues, uh, one of my friends in Auckland took care of, Paul Baker. She had this massive edema of her tongue. It was a general thing, and she had to actually have part of her tongue resected. I can't imagine when she's six and eight years old, the social stigma of going around with her tongue sticking out. Um, my friend Paul put her to sleep with a straight blade using muscle relaxers. He did that after he scoped her. So I scope a lot of people with short riding learning scopes, but you cannot put this kid to sleep with that tongue without checking the back first and knowing, uh, or not without risk. This little one had her mandible fused to her zygoma and no neck, uh, no jaw mobility, and also her mouth didn't open, so she's completely fused. This was recognized in utero, and my friend Paul was asked to intubate her. He did so in utero. So what happened was, leaving mom connected to baby, they opened up the uterus. He put in a specially designed LMA type device, ran a special scope and a special tube over the scope, and put the tube in the kid via this supraglottic airway.
before mom and me were disconnected, after they could verify they were breathing, this kid, and ventilating the lungs, they then separated from the baby. Incredible. So she has now had her airway sequentially replaced. She, she was having inside, you know, uh, artificial mandibles, and she's got a successive traits, and she's now a teenager. She's the first person in the world to survive this, because most of these kids die on presentation, because you just can't ask. Um, RSI in kids is, you know, common and better, and, uh, you know, this is not the case that goes with this, but this is just pyloric stenosis, that struggling with awake infants isn't a great plan, but we have to have a plan of how we do RSI safely. I ventilate everybody on induction. Now, in the folks who are isolating well, just doing their airway for protective reasons, I might ventilate once or twice, with their head elevated, ear to sternal notch, gentle bag ventilation, I have nasal cannula on. I'll do that during the 60 seconds it takes for the muscle relaxers to kick in. And I like when I can see that I can bag, and I announce to everybody in the room, okay, we're bagging, and I know I can. I like doing that, and I like getting the alveoli a little bit open during the rest of the 60 second period. Now what I don't do is I don't reflexively throw in all the airways on induction. Do that and they gag and vomit, now you have a vomit filled airway. So, you know, I see them coming into the room, they're gonna need their airway bench, they're set up, hose up the nose, pull on the mandible, get everything ready. I have a secondary oxygen source sometimes if they need peak because I can, you know, if high flow oxygen via the nose does not get them to 99 or 100, you gotta think about the need for peak. If you're in the low 90s or 80s with high flow nasal oxygen, you're gonna need peak. So I, I would bag with a peep valve, and then we tee up the drugs, I turn to the nurse, I say, who's got the drugs? Leah says, I do. I go, Leah, tell me when we're at 60 seconds. Because I tend to jump the gun. 60 seconds seems like an eternity when your heart's going fast. So she reminds me when it's 60 seconds. But as the drugs go in, and as the patient stops breathing, I will bring them back to ear external notch position. I'll do gentle bagging. On the really sick ones, I continue bagging through the whole cycle, low volume, low pressure, here's no much. On the not sick ones, I do it once or twice just to see. I make sure the mandibles pull forward, I'm blowing those up the nose, and then I pick up the laryngoscope when she says we've reached 60 seconds. But here's interesting, you know, a thousand cases, one gastric regurgitation, this is all the general ventilation and no cricoid pressure. And uh, anyway, I think that's a safe practice, and I think it's good for oxygenation. It's a little bit about no DSAT in kids, and we'll talk more about that. High flow nasal cannula, I need to tell you that that basically is the first response we should be doing in these sick kids. If you don't have the machine, if you have to get RT to get your high flow nasal cannula, just run a standard nasal cannula. You can do that for a few moments while you're setting up. But it is amazing to me how much more effective nasal cannula is than the non rebreather bag. Um, so, um, very well because of how much light there is. But I was going to show you some laryngoscopy cases. We'll try here. So there's a lot of black, but we're coming down. There's the uvula, and we're looking for the epiglottis. In this case, we go a little deep, and then we're going to get to it in a second here. There's posterior structures, and there's that omega epiglottis. Um, I don't know how you guys can see that because of the light. Um, but there's a lot of subtlety to doing laryngoscopy. You know? So we do a little bit of manipulation and then we see the posterior structures there, we see the verbal cleft. Look at this kid's nose. Don't they look like stuck on? It's kind of weird the way what kids' noses look like. Dunk, like they've just been. Anyway, there's uvula and there's amidst the pink bush is epiglottis. So that's one of the things about the airway. It's all pink bush. Like, and the saliva causes the epiglottis to camouflage into the background. So, you know, we then found that we lifted up, this is a, a Miller blade, and uh, a little bit of retraction of lip there, and we start seeing some of the larynx. Um, again, the way this camera works, it has trouble dealing with the light peripherally, so we tend to see, you know, the area at the center. But this is a good example of how pliable the pediatric airway is, and how much a little bit of manipulation of the neck causes a big deal. So we go down, and we're going to get the uh, great view of larynx there, the cords. And look what happens when somebody goes and presses on the neck, 
and you're going to see the front of the trachea just move right into the airway there. So the kids' airways are really pliable. If you were doing excessive cricoid pressure, and back in the day we did cricoid pressure like it was a religious obligation, I, what can happen is you obstruct the airway. Uh, I don't think we should do cricoid pressure, particularly in children. I think most of the badness that we see in children with aspiration of big bellies is because EMS, and I understand why, the back of a rig, can you imagine how difficult it is to bag a kid in the back of a moving ambulance? You're jacked up, you're over -ventilated. They come up with these big bellies, and then they regurgitate on the first line of gunstone. So one of the things I do in all the piece resuscitations is I tap and I feel how big the belly is. But I anticipate the fact that many of these kids are going to puke on induction. Um, and I decompress the belly. In piece resuscitation sometimes, decompressing the belly can be very helpful when, you know, they're really, really distended. But here's you feel a touch at the gloss. Again, that's a design feature. We have the posterior structure, there's a little bit of goo, but then look at how nice those pearly whites are. So after about 20 years of being a consultologist in New York City and Philadelphia, really smart academic institutions, where I was really good at trying to anticipate what my consults would say if I called them too late, and being very nervous about that, and fighting over every admission, I wind up in this tiny little hospital in Northern New Hampshire, I'm there for a few months and I'm loving life. I got the skis in the back of the car. If I get to sleep on the overnights, I can drive home. I need a couple of ski areas on the way. And um, life is good. And then one morning about 9.30, I'm having a great shift, I'm catching up on my emails. This guy comes in and he actually has a metallic farm body embedded in his cornea. It's been there for a day and a half. It's you know, a nice big rust ring and a big piece of metal there. And I look at him and I go, you know, I haven't really used a, a uh, and Alger Burr much to get these out. I'm going to send you down to Dartmouth. And he goes to me, you don't need to, Doc. The last year I got, got it. He goes, why don't you check it out on YouTube and try it? Because I don't want to go down to Dartmouth. <laughs> I kid you not, he encouraged me to do so. And I did. And it worked. And a couple of years later, I was talking to this ophthalmologist about the fact that I didn't really feel comfortable with these high-speed pieces of metal, these Alger Burrs, and they freaking eye. I mean, I used to send these when I was at Penn to Shea. I used to send it when I was at NYU to some other place. Anyway, and he goes, you know, when we were training, we took cow eyeballs with pepper flakes, and it's really hard to puncture the eyeball. He goes, don't, don't worry about it. Just, you know, but the key, which I discovered, because when you're holding an algebra and it's vibrating a gazillion times a second, your hand cannot be in space. You have to swoosh your hand, Vulcan mind melt with the patient. So you come in from the side, and your hand is completely stabilized. I am now obsessive about these little mechanics, whether it's two fingers of a rigoscope, dental blocks, you know. If I'm going on the right side, that's fine. I can face the patient. If I'm going on the left side, the patient is down and coming from above. But I think about the ergonomics, you know, if I'm cutting the neck, I'm going to be on the patient's right side because my hand needs to rest on the sternum, what I call sternal stabilization. But I think about these ergonomics, they're really important. Oh, I was going to tell you this story about this case. So I had this, uh, yeah. So I had this uh, case in New Hampshire, and after, right after I had removed the farm body, and I'm feeling like, hey, this great job. Um, this, uh, I hear overhead code blue delivery group, and I turn to the ER nurse and I go, "What's with that? Family practice having a bad day?" And she goes, "No, you are." I go, "What do you mean? That's you, Doc. You're the only guy." I'm like, "What? New kids? That's not me. Newborn delivery? No." Get your ass down the hall. I go, oh crap. So it's a one floor hospital. It's not hard to find, you know. And I go running down the hall. There's a bunch of nurses going in there. And the entire administration of the hospital is there. Uh, by the way, the administrator of the hospital is a nurse practitioner. She's there. The chief medical officer is another mid level. She's there. Um, you know, New Hampshire is kind of a quirky libertarian place. Live free or die. There are greater evils than death, for those of you not familiar with the state motto. But live free or die is what it says. It's the first state in the country to have all-female government. Um, two senators, two House of Representatives, female governor, lieutenant governor, Supreme Court justice. But, live free now. Uh, but uh, anyway, so when I run down, and all these people are pushing me into the room, and I look in there, and this big burly dude comes up to me and says, uh, I'm the CRA, but I don't do kids. And I don't have them. Oh, okay. And they're thumping on this little baby. They're thumping on this little baby. My heart rate starts to get a little bit up, and I'm like, oh crap. And I look in, 
Somebody yells out, we got pulses. I look at the guppy breaths. I go, I think we need to intubate. Everyone in the room says, so. and then they all step back one. <laughs> I look around the room and I'm like, uh, I guess it's me. Uh, I haven't done a Pete's Code now in 15 plus years, like solo, solo. You know, I remember when I first ran into the DR sometimes in Bellevue, but then, you know, Pete showed up, neonatal folks showed up. Like, this is me. Uh, and a whole crowd of people watching. And as I pick up the laryngoscope, what I didn't know was that this hospital, they had had a, a Pete's Code difficulty of managing the airway, hypoxic, hypoxic injury. So everybody was freaked. They'd already launched the helicopter from Dartmouth when this kid coded. Um, so the helicopter's inbound. This kid is guppy breathing. I pick up the laryngoscope and I hear somebody yell in the back of the room, he's from the ER, but supposedly he's good at airway. <laughs> no pressure, right? But no, but I, I think about this, you know, honestly, because I just picked up the laryngoscope with the lightest of grip. And I just told myself, Find the uvula, points the epiglottis. Uvula, epiglottis, control the tongue, drop the tube in, the kid pinks up. I did an umbo line. Anyway, three weeks later, mom and baby come back to the hospital just to thank everybody. It's one of the best cases in my career. Um, but I think the key to doing well is the first steps. And you gotta pick up that brain scope very lightly. Um, so uh, here, let's just, uh, I wanna show you a couple other cases, and then I'll show you a couple of video laryngoscopies. But, you know, whether you're using the video or direct, the Pete's airway is high. The epiglottis is often camouflaged against the posterior pharyngeal wall. And so this is a Wisconsin blade. So the intention here is to lift it direct. But we wind up ultimately, after a couple of manipulations, up oh, there we go, we finally have it under control, but there's a little bump, bump, notch. You know, by the way, in children, tube delivery is usually easy because the tube is small relative to the laryngoscope and mouth opening. But if you're using a narrow blade, Miller blade, don't try to sweep the tongue because what happens, narrow flange Miller blades, the tongue falls over to the side. So go down, and I go midline with the curved blade, midline with the straight blade. I find the uvula, points at the upper glottis, I tilt under, control the tongue, and then I pivot the straight blade back to the right. I make no effort to sweep. But cognitively, I am always doing epiglottoscopy before I do laryngoscopy. Uvula points to epiglottis, control the tongue, and then I pivot the straight blades back to the right. Here's a, a bigger kid that's a good view of both the trachea and the esophagus. So we go down and we go a little deep, and at first we have this little, there's a vague hole down here, and I said, oh, let's get that. So you see there's a roundness to that. And then we go a little deep, we come back, and there's that vertical cleft of the larynx. When we retract the upper right lift, you can see them together. But I think one of the things that happens when people are freaked about the airway is they see a hole and they run at it. So, you know, you think of, we have, some people in emergency medicine have taught people just to plunge in and back up. But the problem is you get landmark confusion. So I think you really want to go slow, you get the points that epiglottis, look for those posterior structures. Um, by the way, on my website, I have a ton of these Pete's cases. Um, so here's a challenge in your way, and there's some manipulation, but it's kind of dark. Let's see what we can see here at the center of it, and if you can, great, otherwise I'll move on to the video where it goes. But here is you be able to touch an epiglottis, classic, in small children. And we're going to tilt down and lift direct, is the intent. But somebody has their hand on the neck, and it is affecting dramatically our ability to lift the epiglottis. And in my view, nobody should be touching the neck when I'm trying to do laryngoscopy. So eventually the operator brings their hand in and does his own manipulation, and is able, in this case, to use a straight blade as a mat and indirectly elevate the epiglottis enough just to see that bump, bump, notch, and drop the tube in. But laryngoscopy is about subtlety of force, tip blade position. Here's a massive tonsil case. And I showed this, not that it was a hard airway, but when you have tonsillar bleeding, okay, what can we do about tonsillar bleeding? Post tonsillectomy cases, you can squirt some TXA out, you can put some gauze on their hand, actually, soak it in TXA, and have them look at tonsil. I guess it works really good. But what you don't want is somebody bleeding, lame 
flat on the back, filling your stomach. Um, I would not do ice water, it tends to fill up your stomach. Uh, but you want to do some compression. And I find TXA amazing now for nosebleeds. And TXA gauze, and have the patient apply it and hold some pressure. Not, works pretty well. Um, so I do no DSAT for the laryngoscopy. I do a video laryngoscopy. Um, we tend not to use as many hyperangulated blades or video laryngoscopes in kids, particularly little kids, because most kids are using intubate. That being said, they can be very useful. Here's a uh, cleft palate case, glide scope, and uh, you know, easy airway. You know, generally the palate is not the problem. So you're going to see here the cleft palate. So this kid's breathing still, getting a dose of ketamine. Ketamine, by the way, is a great drug. I like giving it. I'm a little careful with peritonsillar badness and things in the mouth, but for the procedural space in kids, I do a lot of ketamine. But notice that light grip on this little orangescope. And they come around the curve and get this incredible view, and they use this, um, they, they're using a little laryngo tracheal anesthetic wand to get around the curve. Wide scope now has a little plastic infant side left, by the way. Um, let's take a look at uh, another case from my friend Paul Baker. He works at a hospital called Starship, and it's really cool. You walk in, and there's huge hall, and there's airplanes floating, and there's all kinds of stuff. And the kids walk in, and they're just like, wow, it's just such a cool looking place. Um, but check out this kid. He's kind of on a ketamine high, I think. Um, so here's uvula. Look at that uvula. Here's the palatal arch coming down, the pharyngo at the bottom fold, area at the bottom fold, bump, bump, notch, cords. It's like you could drive a truck through there. Um, they, they're spraying lichen here. I guess the blunt laryngeal response and hyperdynamic response intubation. I never do that. But uh, they're putting in a micro laryngeal tube. It's got a micro cuff on it. So watch this. You're going to see a cuff, but it's, the cuff is very thin and it's very adherent to the tube there, which is really nice. Nice. Um, all right. So. Let's talk about the omega epiglottis. Since we're talking about peas, we can kind of talk about the omega epiglottis, right? But this is an adult, and in fact, I want to warn you that in big, fat people, there is an epidemic of what I call the omega epiglottis. How does this happen? I think it's just fat everywhere. But check it out. It's kind of pediatric, almost. But this man is 400 plus pounds. He's a huge dude. And at the bottom of the laryngoscope, as I'm Checking it out, I get this tiny little moose hoof shaped, little bitty, pediatric looking, folded on itself, epiglottis. What the heck is that? It's a tiny little epiglottis, folded on itself, in a 400 pound man. What the heck? You know, there's all these like predictive scores for difficult intubation. So I've decided to add one, which is, if you have a dude, and you have trouble placing a Foley in a dude, think about that, 400 pounds, can't find where the Foley goes, he might be a difficult airway. I'm <laughs> just saying, you might have the Omega at the box. You might. I think there's a high probability of the Omega at the box. So I want to share with you a response to the Omega at the box, this time using the CMAT. So the same case, same case, I go in with the CMAT, and we're in the cadaver lab, and, you know, actually all the bodies are filled with fluid. It's great, but you practice that with autoscopy. But it's easy to be off-center amidst pink mush and lose landmarks. You know, it's like when you're trying to find the cervix, don't go up and down the spectrum. Take the thing out, put your finger in, find the cervix, and then go in for it. But no, but this happens in the airway. So look, I'm off-center, and it turns out that the epiglottis is going to pop up on the right side there. I don't recognize it because I'm looking here, but the epiglottis is the only horizontal line. But I'm off center. So I'm looking there and I'm like, what the heck is this? I can't find it, I can't find it. I end up reinserting the microscope. So I take it out, and now I reinsert it, and all of a sudden, it's on the left. I'm like, hello. And now I pivot around to the left. And look at that epiglottis. It's the freaking Holland Tunnel. Now, you could try to frame that with a bougie, um, but instead, I go 
deep with my low profile Mac 4 blade, and I use the Mac as a number. I lift the epiglottis direct. Now I've got posterior cartilage with bump on notch. I've got the false lower boards there. We're not seeing into larynx very well. But, you know, Mac as Miller can be very useful in the adult with that pediatric omega epiglottis. Um, I lost my last slide. Can you put me back up? Oh, play. Yep. So uh, every month in June, I go off to the Tetons and I watch critters, moose, bear, elk. Come to the Tetons. Uh, they're beautiful. Uh, we do an endoscopy course. Every month I'm in Baltimore. If you want to share a lot of larynx, you'll see more larynx in one day than in more than 10 years. Um, it's a ton of fun. Anyway, I just want to thank Paul and Lexi again and shout out, as I mentioned earlier, to some of my mentors who are in the crowd. Thank you very much for having me. The owner of this black pack, I think he's lost it. Uh, so I want to say something quickly. Um, Dr. Levitan was blessed with a really good intellect and work ethic and a sense of scientific curiosity. Uh, and then he was lucky to run into some good teachers and good circumstances in life. And the result has been that he has had a laser focus in his career on one singular thing, emergency airway management. And I don't think that it's exaggeration or hyperbole to say that he has changed the way we do things in medicine. Um, and that's a really uh, special thing for any doctor to do in their career. So on behalf of everybody who might someday need an emergency airway, thank you. And on behalf specifically of all NYC and all the residents in New York City, thank you for traveling to be here with us and uh, spending some time with us. Thank you. Let's go for this. 
You know, and we all think of standard therapy. When we think of standard therapy, we think of the we think of like albuterol, epitropium, combis. We give steroids right away. And steroids usually take about four to six hours to take effect. So we're like, let's wait a little bit. Uh, but things you don't think about, that Dr. Levitan also mentioned, are like oxygen. You know, they're oxygen deprived. So always up the nose, like he says, if you can, if they're hypoxic, crank it up to 60. <laughs> Trying to be the effect that he did. Um, and you should try to pump it all the way up as high as possible. Um, keep doing the albuterol, keep doing the hypotropium. And the next step we usually think about is like magnesium. You can give up to 50 uh, mix per cake, up to three times. But you know, if you're at that point, you're already thinking about admitting this patient. You're already thinking about, you know, what the next steps are. And the question is, after magnesium, do you immediately intubate these patients? No. Usually you want to wait a little bit. You want to see how they respond to the magnesium. If they're still tachypnic, still tachycardic, you have other options before intubating them. You want to try non-invasive ventilation. I don't know what happened to my slides. They're missing that first part where it says non-invasive uh, ventilation. It's supposed to say BiPAP or high flow is okay BiPAP is a great option for these kids. So sorry about that, I'm missing those. It's supposed to say BiPAP first. Uh, BiPAP first. Try that, or high flow rates of cannula. If they're somewhat eligible, they can still follow your uh, you know, commands a little bit. BiPAP is great because there's IPAP, which helps deliver tidal volume and can basically uh, help uh, you know, decrease the work of breathing. EPAP is great because it helps recruit, uh, recruit alveoli. While uh, high flow nasal cannula is great because it has some intrinsic peak, about seven, uh, people seven, and delivers 60 plus liters of oxygen rapidly, uh, decreasing CO2 rebreathing at, the, at that time. Now, if you have a patient who is, uh, you know, you're worried that the albuterol is not going to reach their alveoli, you know, you might want to reach for epinephrine. That was the next uh, thing on that. So epinephrine is also an option. It's an alpha and beta agonist. Uh, it'll help open up the airways. You have to worry about tachycardia a little bit, but uh, children can usually handle tachycardia fairly well. If you have turbulent in a, a hospital, that's also an option. You can give these medications IV, IM, you know, all the way like if, The other day I had a case, uh, a 10 year old male who came in who was blue, hypoxic, asthma. We gave him epinephrine IM, and he pinked up right away, and we continued to give him bones up the nose. We, uh, you know, bagged him a little bit too, and we started getting ready, everything ready for intubation. If those aren't working, you could also try, you know, let's say you have a patient who is super agitated, think like hypoxic, hypercarbic, uh, they're confused. You could try a little bit of ketamine to help them, you know, get them through that anxiety phase that I can't breathe. Uh, ketamine will help them get in sync with BiPAP. Obviously have everything you need to intubate them at bedside if you can do that because some people will go into immediate apnea. There's some people who say Heliox is an option. How many of you guys know where your Heliox is in the hospital, right? Not, that's great, but you know, RT sometimes has to look for it. In a crashing asthmatic patient, you don't always want to reach for Heliox. And Cochrane studies have shown that it doesn't always benefit. It can help improve laminar flow, but at the same time, it has an FIO2 of about only 40%. So if the patient's hypoxic, you don't want to reach for Heliox, especially if you have other, things, other options available. Now, this is where we get to the part where we say, hey, listen, you know, we're thinking about holding off intubation, but sometimes it's necessary in asthmatics, and you, know, you should be really, really prepared. You don't want to just go ahead and rush through an uh, asthmatic intubation. Uh, so why is it so bad to intubate asthmatics, right? You're thinking like, oh, man, airway breathing is bad. Isn't the next option just ET2? Well, no. They're already hypoxic. They're already hypercarbic. They have basically acidosis a lot of times. And, uh, you know, they're hyperinflated, so they have a decreased venous return. All of them sets them up for poor uh, results after intubation. So, you know, and the other thing is it also doesn't fix the problem that's at hand. There's a bronchoconstriction that needs to be reversed, and a mechanical ventilator may help with that, but doesn't reverse that problem. When you intubate an asthmatic, if the patient's like severely out of mental status, you know, GCS less than eight, they're not able to follow any commands. If they're getting bradycardic, that's a sign that you should get everything ready to intubate the patient, or if they have a completely silent chest. Now, if you're like listening, you can't hear anything, and the patient's like, uh, you know, I, even if they're speaking one word sentences, think about intubation, right? So when you intubate them, 
always have usually the most experienced provider, right? You're gonna sedate and paralyze somebody who is already at a high risk for rapid acidosis, high rate risk for bradycard breaking down and arresting. So you don't want to take a lot of time looking for the epiglottis. You don't want to take a lot of time doing that, like pushing through the airway. You want to take it slow and steady. And after intubation, the worst part starts. You're not done. You're, you've got the tube in. That's not the goal. You want to make sure that you're continuing the albuterol, continuing the medications that help to open up the uh, airway. And you want to set the ventilator correctly. So you want to have a low tidal volume, about six uh, mix per k. You want to have a low respiratory rate, sometimes as low as 6. You can even go up to 12. But the reason why you do that is to avoid auto thinking, which is basically air trapping, which leads to barrel trauma. It can lead to breaking down and arrest as well. And you want to keep a short eye time. You want to let them inspire and then take a deep breath out. Um, maintain a plateau pressure, less than 30. If you don't know how to do that, ask your respiratory therapy, therapist how to move inspiratory hold of your ventilators. That is going to be key to make sure, make sure that making sure there's no barrier And you want to maintain synchrony with the ventilator. So you want to make sure that if you have to, you sedate them as much as you need to, and you paralyze them if you need to, so that they're in sync with the respiratory rate that you set. Now, let's say you've tried all that, and the patient's still satting poorly, and they're still wheezing, and they're still not doing well, but they're maintaining their heart rate, and they're, being, they're still somewhat stable. What are the next, next options? It's all lost? Not, not always. You should get in touch with your anesthesiology buddies or anyone that can, uh, any hospital nearby that does ECMO and see if they'll come and set up ECMO for you. Anesthesiology in the meantime, if, they have, if you have time, can help you out too. So uh, isofluorine and semifluorine are great you know, bronchodilators. They can help to open up the airway as well. You should think about getting in touch with them. But if you don't have enough time, First, call your ECMO specialist and let them know that you need EV ECMO set up so you can bypass the lungs and oxygenate the blood outside the body. No. And always be prepared to do the next thing. Always be prepared to think sequentially. Don't just start the uh, you know, intubation first. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. Not vaccinated their children. 
Okay, good. The stock is for you and everyone else. So, um, downstairs there was a, well, uh, on the way here I heard someone say that Alexander Hamilton's home is just around the school. And there's a statue of uh, George Washington downstairs. So history is rich here. Um, there was a battle of the Revolutionary War fought um, near the heights here. Um, the reason I'm talking about history is these aren't Halloween costumes. This is what medicine did for the first 1,500 years. Um, there was a man known as uh, Galenus. Um, he was a Greek uh, doctor. He was the founder of sort of empiricism. He uh, studied a tremendous amount of anatomy, and he believed that there were four flowing, you know, uh, uh, humor within the body. There's black bile, there's yellow bile, there's blood, there's phlegm. And then what medicine did at that point, and it literally occurred for 1,600 uh, years, is we bled people. Um, um, we bled them more, um, and we put holes in their head to release these humors. Um, and our president, does anyone know on his deathbed that he was bled not once, not twice, not thrice, but four times um, before he died? They had 32 fluid ounces of blood taken out of him before he died. He ate modern medicine. So, but then you have uh, Simmons, you have Pasteur, um, and uh, Robert Cook, or Cook, um, who really changed medicine. So for the last 150, 200 years, we have the germ theory, and medicine now is on the up and up, so we're coming in on a good time. Who here has children? So this is the vaccine schedule. It's a lot. Um, just for you, you know, for those who don't know, you know, under one year of age, you got a whole bunch, and then after that, and the reason we give immunizations at certain periods is based on how your immune system is going to respond um, to the vaccines. So after a year, you get a whole bunch of uh, flu after six months. So what is the issue? Why don't people vaccinate their children? Well, this was the classic article in Lancet that was published in 1998 that linked MMR um, to autism. And just so you understand, it was Lancet that published it. It was some pretty impressive data, um, and the pathophysiology made sense. Um, you also had celebrities get on board and say, hey, this is crazy. You know, I'm not going to vaccinate my kids. There is also a lot of distrust of, sorry, we're in the back of the room, um, to pharmaceutical companies, big pharma, controlling medicine. There was not always honest conversation about mercury, which was in vaccines. And then Finally, medicine sort of caught on and started having a lot more open conversation about this. But the response to this, oh yes, this is the old slideshow as well. Um, the response to this, and I don't know if you guys can see, this tells you about non-vaccinators throughout the country. So you guys are going to graduate and go throughout. Um, in 2010, uh, the non-vaccinator rate was 2.5%. In 2016, the non-vaccination rate was 4%. And you can see in the northwest, um, it's much bigger than higher. So we need to know the community that you're dealing with. So what was the sort of the response to non-vaccinators? Well, Lancet figured out because, um, that the data was just about there. So the MMR autism link, even though there was something that sort of seemed feasible, doesn't exist. And they retracted the article, even though people still feel that there is a good in there. But there is none. You have, just like you have celebrities on one side, you have celebrities, have, have anyone seen his segment about the other you know, vaccinators? It's pretty funny. It's pretty vitriolic, um, which I have a problem with. 